this is my last session. I am definitely looking forward to getting out of these black shirts. They give us exactly one to wear for three days. So if you've seen us in between sessions, we do change out of these as quickly as possible because we know we have to put them back on again. But I'm tired of black. It's time to wear a different color. Uh, today we want to talk about troubleshooting Windows 7 deployments. Um, I, I kind of do a, a lot of this, uh, not quite intentionally, but in a lot of cases there are a variety of issues that can go on during an actual Windows 7 deployment. And even when you see an error dialog on the screen, it doesn't necessarily tell you what's the real problem going on behind the scenes. So you need to dig in. And digging in really means looking at lots of log files. There are lots of moving parts during an actual Windows 7 deployment. Each of those underlying tools creates its own logs. So guess what? We're going to end up spending a lot of time talking about log files and looking at log files and seeing the types of things that you would find in those log files. So for those of you who were in my session yesterday, which was pretty much one long demo from start to finish, unfortunately, this one's going to be a long series of PowerPoint slides. There, there's just so much to cover and so little time to do it in that we don't have time to actually look at what these would look like on a real machine, but hopefully you can get an idea just from uh, exploring the different options or the different scenarios that we're talking about to figure out when I run into a similar situation, what types of troubleshooting will I need to perform? So we really have a range of deployment solutions starting off with kind of that base layer of the Windows AIK tools, the Automated Installation Kit tools. I believe uh, Rhonda Layfield has a session in the room next door right after this talking more about those underlying Windows AIK tools and what they actually do. But every deployment solution that Microsoft builds is built on top of those. The same would also be true of any third-party tool. So at that base layer you have standard things like USMT, Windows PE, and uh, ImageX and similar tools like that. Windows Deployment Services is the next layer on top of that that provides Pixie and multicast services for whatever solutions we build. We talked a lot yesterday about the Microsoft Deployment Toolkit and its light touch deployment capabilities, which are layered on top of those tools. We didn't get so much into Configuration Manager, but it is kind of that next step up, so to give you the scale of being able to push out hundreds or thousands of machines at a time. But then even MDT integrated into that provides capabilities as well. So we've got all these scenarios and all these different products. We want to try to touch on each one of those during the session today and show you the types of issues that you may run into and how to troubleshoot on each one of those. So most of you have probably seen these types of dialogues if you're doing deployments today. The one in the nice pretty salmon color that Rhonda mentioned yesterday is the, the typical MDT light touch error. If you run a task sequence and that task sequence fails, we'll detect the error and put up the screen that shows it failed. Unfortunately, it just gives you a generic 8000040005 which means nothing more than an error occurred. So how do you figure out then what was the error? How do you dig in deeper from there? The one on the other side is from Configuration Manager. Same basic idea. The task sequence failed with an 8000400005. You'll get very used to seeing that error number showing up in various log files. What does it mean? Literally, an error has occurred. That's all it means. So. Digging in is essential. The one in the middle is what Windows displays after it hasn't actually shut down successfully. So in that case, now we've got to get even deeper into the process because Windows most likely blue screened and we had to figure out why. So we had to get to that root cause. The error messages are typical, typically not useful, especially the ones you see on the screen. So how do we dig in to find the additional details that we need? The log files are there. First challenge is you have to be able to find them, and then you need to be able to dig into each one and see what it actually says. So let's go through a fairly long list of log files. Starting with the Windows log files themselves. When you install Windows 7, it keeps a log of everything that it's doing during that installation process. Regardless of how you install it, 
it's going to create the setupact.log and the setuperror.log. If there's a failure that occurs, it'll be in that log. Now, the challenge is these logs kind of move around based on the, the point in the process that you're currently at. So if you're early in the process, you'll see them show up in a dollar windows tilde bt sources panther folder. Those go away fairly quickly, so if you've got an error really at the beginning of the process, you'll see the logs there. Afterwards, they move into the Windows Panther folder. And then for the final steps of the process, the UBI initialization, they're in C Windows Panther Unattend GC. How many of you have ever tried to sysprep a Windows XP image? You run sysprep.exe, it comes up with an error that says something generic like unable to update registry. It's one of those really annoying things in Windows XP that any time you ran sysprep, if there was an error, all it would give you is a little dialog. There were no logs, no details, nothing to tell you what actually happened. It's one of the, and one of the many improvements in the installation process for Windows 7 is even sysprep writes out a log file now. So when you run sysprep, if you get any errors from sysprep, you can dig into the sysprep panther logs, which would be found in system32 sysprep panther. The format of the logs, regardless of where they're at, is consistent. They're described in a KB article, 927521, which gives you kind of the, the basics of what to look for. The theory behind the two different log files is that the setuperror.log contains just the stuff you would care about, the errors that were logged during the process. The problem with that is that's usually not enough to see what was really going on. You need to, you can look at the error log to try to key in on it might be this, but then open up the setup ACT log and look at the context around that to see if that truly was a problem. There are additional logs created during the setup process as well. Fortunately for these, they get into much more specific scenarios. There's a cbs.log, which shows the results of any driver and uh, component updates that get injected during the OS install process. So if you're installing hotfixes, injecting them through the unattend file, or having MDT or Config Manager inject updates offline, they would show up, the details of that would show up in the CBS log. Anything related to driver installation shows up in the setupapi.dev.log. The challenge there is if you are injecting drivers during the process, now you need to look in two places. You need to figure out, did that driver get injected into the OS in the first place? Was it staged into the Windows 7 driver store? And then was it detected and installed as part of the normal plug and play process? So you get into that two-phase two scenario and Really, when you add MDT and Config Manager into it, there's now a third part of it, too, because you need to check was the driver copied to the machine initially, then was it injected, then was it installed. So yeah. you kind of need to combine some of these together to see the whole picture and be able to follow it through. When it comes to domain joins, netsetup.log is the main log file that shows the details on that. That is useful any time that the domain join fails. If you're used to Windows XP, during mini setup, if the domain join failed, it would stop during mini setup and you would have to basically tell it to retry or continue anyway. With Windows 7, what happens if a domain join fails? Nothing, it just keeps on going. So in that case, the machine will come up in a work group and you'll have to manually fix that after the fact. In the case of MDT 2010, we knew that would cause a variety of issues. So we've actually added logic into the task sequence to retry the domain join after it's up and running in the full OS. What kind of problems would you run into? Well, how about user state? If you try to restore the user state for a domain user and you're not joined to a domain, things aren't going to work so well. So that's why we want to try to get the domain join to actually happen. The last one on the list here, Windows Update.log. That's useful in situations where you want to figure out what's going on with WSUS or a config manager uh, install software update step or uh, just a standard Windows update execution. That will log 
two, really two different types of information that are useful. One is which server am I talking to? Am I talking to the internet? Am I talking to a WSUS machine? Am I talking to my config manager SUP? It will also then show you for each update that's being installed, was it successful, was it not successful, or any issues that were encountered along those lines. So that was pretty much the set of log files for Windows itself. Now let's shift to Windows PE. In this case, fortunately, the list is fairly small because it really only does two things. When Windows PE boots up, it initializes and all of those details end up in the WPE init.log, and it installs drivers. And just like in the full operating system, they end up in the setup API log. So you may need to look at those to figure out why did it take so long for Windows PE to start up, what errors were encountered during that initialization, especially around driver injection, and well, why couldn't I find a driver? Why isn't networking actually working uh, in Windows PE? On to Windows Deployment Services then. If you're trying to troubleshoot issues with Pixie or Multicast, you want to see the error messages really on both ends. So you want to be able to see the server side messages and you want to see the client side messages. The server side logging isn't turned on by default, so you have to enable that. There is a KB936635 that describes how to do that. Basically, turn on a registry entry, restart your WDS service, and now it will create the WDS server.log, which contains a variety of useful information around what requests were being received from the clients and what the response was back to those clients. The most useful scenario to, see, to really look at that in is to make sure that a request was actually even seen by the WDS server. That really becomes the first challenge with WDS to make sure that your clients can actually get the Pixie request to the server and the server can respond to it. If you're using Config Manager 2, Config Manager's Pixie service point leverages WDS behind the scenes and it sends periodic ping packets, the Pixie ping packets to the server just to prove that WDS is actually responding. So pay attention to the MAC address and the UUID of the machines that are uh, being logged into the WDS server.log. Don't think that these fake Pixie ping packets are actually coming from your clients. Uh, recognize that that's a special ID that you can just ignore as noise because obviously the config manager server is not going to have any issue sending a ping to itself, but a client three switches away that has to go through switches and routers to get to the server could have issues. State capture then, using the user state migration tool, you'll get different logs depending on what's being done and different logs based on the tool that's actually running uh, these underlying uh, USMT tools. In the case of MDT, it will always create logs called usmtestimate.log, usmtcapture.log, usmtrestore.log. In the case of estimate, it runs when we do an estimate to figure out how much space is needed. We don't always create that, especially if you're doing a hard link migration, so you may not see that one. USMT capture is generated when you do the scan state to capture the old user state. USMT restore is generated when you do the restore of that user state onto the new machine. If you're using Config Manager, those log file names change. They just use scanState.log and loadState.log for the same basic purposes. So in any case where Config Manager, or really where USMT fails, you'll want to look at these logs to see, well, what was the detailed failure? USMT has a series of return codes that are returned during the process. Unfortunately, the task sequencing engine with MDT and Config Manager gets confused by those return codes sometime. Like if it returns a return code 11, I think is the, the typical one. If you ask Windows what's the error message for a return code 11, it'll tell you the printer is out of paper. So the config manager task sequencer log will log a message that says the error was the printer was out of paper. Well, what printer? I'm migrating user state. I'm not doing anything with the printer. <laughs> 
Well, it just so happened that Config Manager used a return code, or USMT used a return code that mapped to a Windows error message that meant printers out of paper. So don't always look at the error messages. Pay more attention to the error numbers. And the fact that there is an error number coming out of a USMT execution should cause you to dig into the USMT logs and see what it really was complaining about. On the task sequence side, everything running during an MDT or a configuration manager task sequence, each step in the process will log the evaluation of the criteria that determine whether this step runs or not, plus the actual command line that's going to be executed and the results of that command line. So you'll definitely want to look at this log anytime you see those uh, typical 8000 messages to see, well, just exactly which step failed and what was its underlying failure. This is another one of those log files that moves all over the place, depending on whether there's an SMS client installed or not, depending on whether we're in Windows PE or in the full OS. Uh, lots of different variations that cause this to bounce around. So if you're ever wondering, well, where should I look to find this thing? Just search the drive. It's easier. Trying to remember, is it in temp? Is it in winder? Is it in underscore SMS task sequence? Is it in the SMS TS log folder? It could be in three or four of these. Because as the process moves along, it'll write to that location. But then at, in the next step of the process, it might reboot into Windows PE and move. So to see the, the consistent all the way through state, you really want every copy of this file that you can find. To complicate matters a little bit more, there are rules in the standard task sequencing engine that say when this log gets to be a certain size, I think uh, one megabyte by default on Config Manager, I think we bumped that up to 10 meg on MDT Light Touch, it'll rename it to SMSTS dash than a date timestamp. You'll want that one too, because it is the full set of logs that really tell you what's going on. The smsts.log that you're ending up with at the end of the process might just have the final message that says the task sequence failed. Well, that's not useful. I need to go back to the previous one to see what the actual failure was. MDT itself, every script that's run as part of the task sequence gets its own log file. They're be going to be put into the mini NT, SMS OSD, OSD logs folder. Unless you're running these inside of a config manager task sequence, then they follow the config manager logs around. In addition to those individual log files, we also create a master log file, bdd.log, that contains all of the entries from all the other log files. So you'll see us ask in most cases, just send us the bdd.log. Don't worry about the other logs because bdd contains everything. There are some things, though, that aren't in that log file. You'll have to look at some of the additional logs that are bits and pieces captured by the external programs run by the scripts. So in the case of uh, the backup capability in MDT, we run image X to create an image of the existing OS before we wipe it off wipe it clean. In that case, we redirect the output of image X to a file so we can look at that later in case there are any errors. So you would look in the bdd.log or the ZTI backup log and see that there was an error running image X. You would then have to look into the ZTI backup image X log to see exactly what happened. On the config manager side, on the server side, there are some additional logs that you may need to look at too if you're running into challenges there. There's a driver catalog.log that gets information about what drivers were sent down to the clients. In the case of Config Manager, the driver injection process is a kind of a client-server based operation. The client gathers up its plug and play ID inventory, sends that as a big packet off to the management point. The management point does its magic and sends a list of drivers back down to the client. Well, you might want to see what that actual uh, result is, and that'll be logged on the server. The importing process, too, where you import drivers into Config Manager, you could run into errors there, and these logs would help out with that as well. Same thing with the task sequence provider. If you're trying to edit a task sequence and getting an error when you're trying to save those changes, you can look on the server in the task sequence provider.log or the smsprov.log, the main provider.log, uh, 
to see what errors are being logged in that case. The typical challenge that you would run into in that case is your task sequence is too big. You've run out of WMI uh, memory pool to save the, the resulting task sequence blob back to Config Manager, so that failed. There are some configuration changes that you can make to increase the amount of memory to avoid that type of situation, but you'd have to contact Microsoft support for that one. So let's say you're in the middle of the process and something isn't going right or the process is hung or something doesn't seem to be happening the way you expect it to. How can I get to the logs during the process? Fortunately, there are some magic keystrokes that you can hook into the process. In the case of Config Manager, there's a checkbox on the boot images that you would need to check to enable the F8 key. With that enabled, if you hit F8 while it's in Windows PE, it'll open up a command prompt. That's nice. You can then look around for the log, see what's happening. And more importantly, the process won't continue, so the machine won't reboot until you exit that command prompt. So if you see that during the task sequence it's installing the OS, but then suddenly it just reboots and nothing else happens, you can get in before that happens, hit F8, and then investigate at the point that that reboot would happen. So as soon as you would type exit in that command prompt, it would then reboot. In the case of MDT Light Touch, we always enable the F8 key. So anytime when we're in Windows PE, you can press F8 to get to a command prompt and it has the same basic behavior as in Config Manager. If you're just running Windows Setup, Windows Setup still has the old XP Shift F10 trick in place. So anytime you see Windows running through its normal, uh, it's not mini setup anymore, it's now actually the specialized and UBI processes, you can hit Shift F10 and get a command prompt there as well. Okay, enough on log files and how to get to them. Let's talk about issues. First with Windows 7. This seems to be uh, the, one of the most common ones, and it, it's one of those that you look at it and say, well, this doesn't really make much sense, but you can try to install the operating system, and it complains that the answer file is invalid. So Windows couldn't process the answer file for the past specialized because it's invalid. In order to figure out what's invalid, because the error message couldn't possibly tell you what's invalid, you had to dig into the log file, and you would see in the log file after you dig in, first, as you get deeper into it, setup failed to apply the image, return code equals 31. That's the first thing to learn, that anytime you see a return code 31 from Windows setup, it means it didn't like the answer file. So then we had to look in setup ACT and setup error.log to see what it didn't like, and in that case, we could see that in Windows shell setup, settings computer name, the value is invalid. Well, why is it invalid? It can only be 15 characters long or less. If you put a lo longer name in there, it causes the process to blow up. Well, why does that happen? It tends to happen with MDT or with Config Manager where people try to set the computer name to something like the serial number uh, because serial numbers on virtual machines especially tend to be very long. On real hardware, like a HP or Dell or Lenovo laptop, they tend to be nice short values, but on virtual machines they're much longer and that doesn't work so well. Another common issue that we tend to see, people get messages saying there are no images available. So they're trying to install Windows 7. They have a WIM file that obviously has images in it, but they get an error back either interactively on the screen like you would see there or just in the log file saying there were no images. Well, which is it? I have a WIM file. You could access the WIM file. You can see what's in the WIM file. How could there possibly be no images? The, the way it's going about the, the logic that it uses is basically to look at the whole list of images that are in the WIM file and then start filtering things out. So the first filter it uses is based on the product key filter out all the images that match the product key that was specified in the unattend.xml file. Well, guess what? If you put in an invalid uh, product key, it will then filter out all the images. So you've gone from however many images you had down to zero. And at that point, even though your answer file probably says, I want image one, 
doesn't matter, it's already removed image one from consideration because it didn't match the product key. So in this case, no images available really probably means something completely different. In this case, I specified a product key for Windows 7 Professional, but I'm trying to deploy Windows 7 Enterprise. Doesn't match, so kick it out. Simple case in this one, for Windows 7, when you're doing a deployment, unless you're using Mac keys, you just leave the product key out. There's no need to specify a product key when installing Windows 7. You're going to be better off without it. One of the first things that people try to do with Windows 7 in a lot of cases is make it fit their old deployment process. So if you were deploying Windows XP, you might have put together your own custom CD or DVD, and you would have it do an unattended install, but then have it run the mini setup process interactively. So you type in the computer name, you'd specify the domain to join, and everything would then come up and be running just fine. Everyone who tries that with Windows Vista or Windows 7 finds out that doesn't work. There is an issue that's considered by design in Windows 7 where if you do that, if you try to run through the normal Ubi wizard, type in a computer name, and then specify to join a domain via the unattend file, it won't work. It ends up joining the domain before it asks for the computer name with some randomly generated name. Then it prompts for a new computer name and renames the computer to that new value without updating the domain account. So guess what? You're left with a broken uh, domain join. The trust has been lost, and you'll have to rejoin the domain later. So in that particular scenario, you would need to defer the domain join, ideally running a script or uh, doing something to make sure that the right computer name is in place at the time the domain join is processed. If you look at MDT or Config Manager, they will make sure that the, both of the values are set properly in the unattend.xml file so that the name is already in place before the join. If you wanted to script it, you could put commands into the process to do a net DOM domain join after the OS is up and running. Here's a fun one from our support group. Lots of people are familiar with Windows XP volume license keys. The standard volume license key that you get for XP, you plug it into your unattend.txt or your sysprep.inf, and you do all your deployments with that same key. So the first assumption is when you're doing KMS, it's the exact same process. So with KMS, we take the KMS key that we get from the licensing uh, site, we plug it into our answer file, and we deploy all of our computers that way. That's not a good thing because that takes every single machine that you deploy and turns it into a KMS server. How many KMS servers should you have in your environment? Well, probably two. How many does a KMS product key allow? Uh, typically, it's around 10. So your first 10 machines happily become KMS servers, and everything after that fails to activate to Microsoft. That is a mess because now you have all of these different KMS machines that you don't really want to be KMS machines. You need to remove the KMS key from them, install just a generic uh, setup activation key, and clean up all the DNS entries that were created by each one of those as they became a KMS server. So that's not the simplest process if you ever do this. You're going to be better off just calling Microsoft support and having them walk you through that process. Believe me, they're very good at it. They do this almost daily. It's surprising how many people take KMS keys and just plug them in the answer files and deploy. The KMS key really is only for activating those two machines in your environment that you intend to use to activate all the other computers in your environment. All of that's described in the volume activation deployment guide, and most people never read it. So that's what happens. They have to call support and get the mess cleaned up. Another challenge that people run into is they do an OS deployment, they specify an OU or container that they want to join, and it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? They put in CN equals computers, and Windows 7 will refuse to join when you specify CN equals computers. That's actually the, the same behavior that you would have seen in Windows XP, 
they didn't handle it there either. But basically, if you want to put a new computer into a container, not into an OU, you need to leave that blank. So don't specify CN equals computers, just leave the, the whole value blank. The deceiving part with this is that you don't get a logical error back saying something like, you can't specify a container when you're trying to join a domain. You get back a message with a 1355 error, which basically means invalid domain. So it, it kind of throws you off on a, a different tangent than what the real problem is. To complicate matters a little bit, if you go into Config Manager into a task sequence where there's a domain join step in the task sequence and click the Browse button and browse to the computer's container, it'll let you put a value like that into your task sequence, which then causes the domain join to fail. So it doesn't protect you from yourself. So simple thing, just don't do it. One of the other challenges that people complain about a lot is they've got their Windows XP environments in place. They have lots of group policies that are applied to that Windows XP environment. They now want to start deploying Windows 7. With Windows 7, they want to have different group policies. So as part of the deployment process, when they're refreshing from an old OS to a new OS, they want to move the machine from one OU to another OU so it picks up different group policies. Sounds simple enough. I can just join the domain and specify an OU that that computer should be put into. But if the computer account is already present in AD, the join process won't move it from one, o, one OU to the other. There's really no good workaround for that one. The best, simplest answer is give your computer a new name. Because in that case, the new name will end up in the OU that you specified, and everything will work fine. Others have worked around this by putting scripts into the task sequence that will actually move the account from one location to another in AD as part of the deployment process. The challenge with that is there are some timing issues because they might update it on one DC and it hasn't yet replicated to another DC in your environment. There are also challenges with the security necessary to do that. What account are you going to embed in your task sequence that actually has rights to AD to move an account from one OU to the other? There are ways to do it with web services, and there are some examples posted on CodePlex that describe how you can put a web service call into your task sequence where you basically delegate that access to the web service and ask it to please move my machine from this OU to that OU. That's at least a little more secure, but it doesn't necessarily handle that replication challenge. The better approach is to consider using WMI filters. So maybe it's something that you need to handle on the back end after the fact. I deployed all these machines today. I'm going to move them all into the new OU. But in the meantime, I can at least put a WMI filter on the OUs, that, on the group policy objects that I don't want to apply to my new Windows 7 machines, causing it to not apply those GPOs as soon as Windows 7 is deployed. Crashes. Well, this is one of those fun ones because by default, Windows won't stop on a blue screen. It'll immediately reboot. So how do you know what was the blue screen itself? All you're going to see is the, the screen that says Windows didn't shut down successfully. Unless you have really good eyes and see the stop message on the, stop, on the top of the screen in the split second before it reboots the box. So usually to troubleshoot those types of issues, you need to disable that automatic reboot so that it actually will stay on the blue screen screen and let you at least read to see, is it a stop 7B? OK, in that case, it means I'm missing a mass storage driver. Is it a stop C000359? In that case, I probably injected the wrong platform of driver. If you tried to load an x64 driver on an x86 OS or vice versa, you get that status 359. Or it could be, who knows, uh, probably a dozen of other common uh, blue screen errors that you would tend to run into there. So if you set the auto reboot equals 0 registry key, you can at least get it to stop there. You may also want to take it a little bit further and have it automatically create a dump file. If you're really good and like uh, using the tools for Analyzing dump files, you could probably figure out from a dump file, for example, which 
driver is the wrong platform because it'll tell you in the dump that the last thing I tried to load was this and this failed. Otherwise, you can upload those dump files to Microsoft support and they will help dig through them. So enough on Windows 7, let's shift a little bit over to Windows PE. What's the most common issue you run into there? Networking issues. So you first, first of all, you need to recognize the difference between there's no network driver and there's a network driver, but it doesn't have an IP address. Or there's a network driver that has an IP address, but it doesn't have the right DNS information. So there are multiple different causes for networking issues. The, the screen on the top, if you just do an IP config, so hit F8, get to a command prompt, and type IP config, if it just has the label that says Windows IP configuration with nothing underneath it, there are no drivers installed. That's the sign that you're missing a driver. If you do IP config and see a 169 address, now it's got a driver, but it couldn't get a DHCP lease from your DHCP server. Well, you look at that and say, well, I know DHCP is working just fine in my environment. Why didn't it work in this case? When you're in a full operating system, it's rather patient when it's requesting a DHCP address. And if there's a delay, it usually doesn't cause any issues because no one's going to log into that machine right away anyway and try to make use of it. But in the case of the deployment process, using MDT or using Config Manager, we immediately want to use the network after we boot it up into Windows PE. All of that's automated. So if you have your typically Cisco switches installed and by default they aren't configured for port fast, uh, negotiation of port speed and duplex. Windows PE will time out before the DHCP address is actually received. That's because the negotiation process can take anywhere from 3 to 15 seconds depending on your actual network hardware in place. The simplest solution is modify your switch port settings to enable port fast on every single switch. The simple way of kind of troubleshooting this to see if that's truly the issue, move the PC from a switch port to a cheap $20 hub that you would buy at your local electronics store. If it then works properly, you know it's a switch port negotiation issue. In the case of dumb hubs, they don't go through that negotiation process, so you, don't, you wouldn't run into this if you were connected to one of those. We've also seen situations where in the full operating system, you're running with a group policy that applies additional DNS suffixes to your network adapters. That enables you to resolve names from those network adapters. When you're in Windows PE, there's no group policy. As a result, you don't get those additional suffixes, so you might not be able to resolve your computer names. In those cases, you can use NSLOOKUP and other tools to try to verify, can I talk to the computer by name from within Windows PE? Microsoft Deployment Toolkit then. If you're doing a light touch deployment, first off, you'll be using the deployment workbench for administrative type purposes. And one of the challenges people run into, especially if you're running MDT on a Windows well, basically server 2008 or earlier machine, it may complain about the WIMGAPI file that's present. WIMGAPI is the DLL that's actually used to modify and get information about WIM image files. So that's a, a key part for us to be able to figure out what's in that image that you just told us to import. If there's a version of that somewhere in the path that doesn't match the version of Windows AIK that's installed on your machine, everything breaks. So in those cases, you'll see an error on the screen because we added additional logic to go looking to see what versions are in the path, tell you that there's one that doesn't match, and suggest the fix, which would be to actually remove the file from that location and let it fall back to the normal one that's in the path. We weren't brave enough to actually go and delete the file from your machine because there are various reasons that it might actually be present there. So uh, we're just telling you that, hey, we found a problem. We're not loading the right version of WIMGAPI. You need to take care of it. So the normal technique for that, open a command prompt, type where WIMGAPI.dll, and the system will tell you where that file exists in the path. 
Normally, you should see it in the C program files Windows imaging folder, and if you're running Windows 7 or later, also in the Windows System 32 folder, and that should have a version that matches the version of Windows AIK. If it doesn't, go ahead and remove it from whatever location, and hopefully then the next entry in the path is the right one. So you can fix that up. Another challenge that you run into is when you import an image into MDT and then click the edit unattend.xml button, you want to launch the Windows System Image Manager to edit the unattend.xml. In that particular scenario, there needs to be a catalog file that matches the image. So MDT knows that, it'll automatically try to generate that catalog file. If it runs into any type of error generating that catalog file, you'll see an error up on the screen that says, well, basically, something went wrong. And that something went wrong is usually some generic stack trace that we got back from the underlying Windows AIK components that we're using to generate this catalog. So figuring out why becomes a challenge because you always get the generic error back and you need to figure out what that generic error means. So you almost need to pay attention to how long it takes to get the error. If you see the error initially right away, then it couldn't even mount the WIM because mounting the image WIM to generate the catalog will take a couple of minutes. If you get an error back in two seconds, well, it didn't even try to mount the WIM. So that's probably a WIM gappy issue. If it went for two minutes and then immediately went another two minutes unmounting the file and then threw up an error message, well, then it couldn't read the registry of the mounted image to see what was actually in it. Or it couldn't get the servicing stack within that image loaded in order to ask it to generate this particular uh, catalog file. Reading the registry is one of those weird operations where the catalog process actually mounts the registry from the underlying image and then enumerates through the registry keys. Antivirus software tends to see that as a malicious activity, so it tends to block, block those types of things. So you might need to disable antivirus from your uh, deployment workbench so it doesn't get scanned like that. The other limitation is that if you're trying to generate a catalog when you're running on a Windows 64-bit OS, but trying to generate a catalog for an x86 OS, that's actually not possible. It's a limitation in Wake, so that, that'll always fail. The only workaround for that one is you may need to install MDT on an x86 machine, generate the catalog on that x86 machine, and then you can make use of it from an x64 machine. So catalogs tend to be a headache. If you never edit an unattend.xml, you never need one, so you may never actually see this. But when you do get into customizing the answer files for your custom images, you may see something like this. Another scenario that we see is during the deployment process, you're deploying Windows 7, but you get an error that says it can't find setup. Well, why can't it find setup? Normally, when you import a full set of source files, we import setup with it. But if you import your own custom image, we give you a choice. You can just import the image file, or you can import the image file and all the setup files along with it. If you just import the image, when it comes time to deploy that image, we'll go searching for another copy of setup.exe on one of the other operating systems in the deployment chair and use that to install your custom image. But if you create a media or a new link deployment share and you replicate just your custom image over to it and not the original source files that we use setup.exe from, you'll get an error like this that just says, sorry, we can't install Windows without setup, so we're going to give up now. So you need to make sure there's always one image on the deployment share that has a full set of the setup, setup files the easiest way is just every time you import a custom image, instead of choosing the first option, no, I don't want to import with setup files, choose the second one, which allows you to specify the path to your original Windows 7 media. So it'll copy the entire media minus the install.wim into the deployment share and then drop the uh, custom WIM on top of that. So it adds maybe 150 to 200 meg of stuff because that's what set up and all of its related files takes up, but it avoids these types of issues when you try to create additional deployment shares or media to do these deployments. 
I mentioned before, task sequence failures can result in 8000400005. All that means is a step failed. You could have incorrect command lines. You could have batch files that you're running without telling it how to run those batch files. So in those cases, you need to specify cmd.exe slash c as the way to run a batch file. Uh, you may run a batch file that has relative references in it. So if you do something like uh, directory name backslash executable or dot backslash and then something else, all of those relative references work okay when you're testing the batch file because you're testing it from a uh, just a local drive path. But in the case of the task sequence, especially in Config Manager, when you go to run this, it's going to run with the working directory set to a UNC. If you try to run a batch file with the working directory set to a UNC, the command prompt can't set the working directory to a UNC. So where does it end up being set to? C Windows System 32. All of those relative references now are going to be relative to C Windows System 32. And it's not going to be able to find a single thing. So that's what causes the batch files to fail in those cases. The simple way is to always reference the paths in your batch files using the path of the batch file itself as the starting point. And in a batch file, you would do that with percent tilde dp0 backslash dot dot and then the rest of the path. Sadly, I had that memorized, but there are different links out there that will tell you how to do batch files in cases where they're being run from UNC paths. The other thing to point out here is I already mentioned that that error doesn't mean access denied. A lot of people are used to looking at error messages from Windows, especially when they're those eight byte or eight digit uh, hex numbers. And they just look at the last digit. And if it's a five, they assume it's security related. That's only true if the first four digits are 8007. If you see 8007-0005, that is a security error. But 8000-4005 is something completely different. So you'll want to use tools that allow you to look up those error numbers to be able to tell you that there's really something else going on. If you run the Trace32 utility, which is part of the Config Manager toolkit, it has a lookup error option. You can type in that number in hex or in decimal, doesn't matter, and it'll come back with the, the description of that particular error message retrieved from Windows. So that would be a better way of looking up those numbers. You can also go to a command line in some cases and type net error message and then a, a number in decimal, but that only works if the beginnings of the error message in hex were 8007. So if you get an error number, convert it to hex, it starts with 8007, then you can look at the last four digits, convert those back to decimal, then go into command prompt and type net, help message, help error message, uh, and then that number and it'll give you a message back. It's much easier to use trace32 or something like that to convert that for you and look it up. Next topic, config manager. If you're using Config Manager with MDT 2010 integrated into it, we've seen situations where the task sequence might get into an infinite loop. That would only happen in this odd combination where you used MDT Light Touch to generate a Windows 7 x64 image, then moved it over to Config Manager to deploy. In that particular situation, there are some COM control references from the original uh, image build process that end up interfering with the Config Manager task sequence. We did fix that with update one. There is a workaround where you can put in a registry command to go out and zap the particular uh, problematic registry key with the, the right value so that that continues. The general task sequence failures are kind of the same description that you would see on the MDT side. The task sequence failed, that means some step returned a return code that didn't match what was expected. So it throws up this error. The main difference to keep in mind on the config manager side is it'll grab the last 1,024 bytes of output from whatever that command was and add it into the smsts.log. So you can see it there. It will also send that same chunk of output to the server as part of a status message. 
So you can run a status message query on the server to look at all the error messages reported by all of your task sequences. In that case, it's simple to just go into Config Manager, create a status message query, and look for all status messages with an ID number of 11135. 11135 is a task sequence step failed, and then it will have the data associated with it so you can see that output. Another issue that we see all the time with Config Manager is people will import the install.wim off of the original Windows 7 media, do their OS deployment, everything works great except Windows is running from D instead of C. It's one of those oddities of the Windows build process. When we create the install.wim inside of the Microsoft build labs, Windows gets installed onto the D drive and is sysprepped onto the D drive. So, if you use something other than setup to install the particular OS image, in the case of Config Manager, it's basically doing an ImageX apply to apply that WIM to the hard drive. When it boots up, by default, it'll use the same drive letter that was used for the original OS. Back in Windows Vista, if you went through that process, you would get a very large descriptive error message on the screen that was like three paragraphs long describing here's the scenario, here's the issue, here's the problem, here's what to do about it. It basically told you that you can't deploy the image that was captured on one drive letter to a different drive letter. Just can't handle it. They fixed that with Windows 7. So Windows 7 now recognizes that situation and says, oh, I'm captured from D but now running on C, I need to tweak all of those registry settings so that D now points to C. No problem, I can take care of that. Config Manager, though, doesn't know about that fix in Windows 7. So they will still force the drive letter to D so that Windows doesn't complain, not knowing that Windows wouldn't have complained once you're deploying Windows 7. So, okay, how do you fix it? Well, you had to build your own custom image. Build your own custom image where you're using an OS install package, to, which runs setup, to install the OS onto C. So now you have C windows. You then sysprep that, capture it as your own custom WIM, import it into Config Manager, deploy that as an OS image package, and now it ends up as C windows instead of D windows. We also see a lot of people that will try to run a Config Manager task sequence and it errors out, saying that there was a hash mismatch. So every package, every piece of content that Config Manager attempts to download from the server to the client, it calculates a hash and compares it against the server calculated hash and if they don't match you get an error message. Unfortunately it seems to happen at random. We don't really know why. We don't have a real way of duplicating that but uh, the, the fix is fairly simple. Just refresh the DP so that it's pushed out again which will cause it to recalculate the hash and the next time it'll probably get it right. The, the wacky part about that one is we get support calls from people who say, yeah, I've had some task sequence failures on 500 machines because of a hash mismatch. Well, did you try one machine before you tried to do 500 of them? So now you have 500 machines that we had to fix instead of one. So that would be the key learning in that case. Try one first at each site because this could be a site-specific, uh, DP-specific issue. If that one machine works, okay, now you can do the, the 500 and have some expectation that all 500 of them would have a, a good hash value. If you do see this issue frequently and you can reproduce it, call Microsoft Support. They would love to hear from you. We're still trying to duplicate that. It happens to me at random intervals. I can't figure out what I do differently from one time to the next. The Config Manager test team can't duplicate it in any scenario. So without a duplication, they can't actually fix it. So if you have a way to duplicate it, they would love to see it. Another situation that you'll run into is you try to run a task sequence, and it complains that a package isn't available on a local DP. That could mean one of two things. It might mean that the package was just never delivered to that DP. It could also mean that the package is just the wrong version on the local DP. In either case, it can't get what it needs from the server. That also could be a client-side issue. The client might be running an older version of the task sequence policy that says, I need package version 3, 
where the DP now has package version 4. The client would see the new task sequence policy the next time it pulls for a policy update. So there's a period of time where things might be out of sync. If it's a client side issue, it kind of fixes itself. The next time you run the task sequence, it should be OK. If it's a server side issue, you need to take some action to either see why the package hasn't been distributed or actually distribute it. You tend to run into this most often when you're just starting off and deploying a task sequence for the first time. You have to remember that for the eight or nine or ten different task sequences or packages referenced by your task sequence, all of those need to be distributed to all of your DPs in your config manager environment. If you miss one, you get that error message. Okay, simple enough, I'll go and distribute that package to the DP and run it again. You run it the second time, it tells you about the second package that was missing. So you fix that one, run it again, now it tells you the third one. So you keep going through that cycle for each package that you're missing until you finally get them all and then it runs through OK. I kind of got tired of doing that, so I put together a PowerShell script that would automate that, which would go out, find all of your task sequences, find all the packages referenced by those task sequences, and then check to see if each one of those were on each of your uh, distribution points in your config manager hierarchy. And if it isn't, go ahead and distribute it. So you can look on my blog and pull down that PowerShell script. But I just routinely run that anytime I create a new task sequence because it'll distribute the packages for me. I don't need to worry about it. When you're doing a config manager OS deployment and using a Pixie service point, basically you're using WDS at the lower level with a config manager component sitting on top of it to actually control the execution of that uh, particular WDS server. In that situation, it could happen that the computers won't pixie boot. Then you have to figure out why. And unfortunately, there are lots of different reasons why. It could be because of network configuration issues. If the pixie request isn't getting to the server, or if the response isn't getting back to the client. You could have boot P configuration issues. You could have port fast configuration issues. You kind of need to recognize the difference between errors that you see on the screen, like the Pixie E53 no boot file name received, and the, uh, the case where it actually sends back an abort Pixie response. If you see an abort Pixie response, that's a good sign, because that means the Pixie request got to the server, the server actively sent back a response to you saying, I don't want to pixie boot you right now. That at least proves your networking was fine. So you completed that whole transaction. But then you had to switch to the server side and be able to figure out, well, why didn't it work? Why did the server respond back to me with an abort pixie request? There could be uh, issues around DHCP configuration, especially if you're running, well, really in either case, there are different configuration issues if you're running WDS and DHCP on the same server versus WDS and DHCP on different servers. And it gets even more complicated if you're running WDS and DHCP on different network segments. It just becomes a, a network configuration issue that you need to understand. Fortunately, there are some WDS white papers that talk through all of those different scenarios and help with that setup. There's also a, a case where Config Manager will never respond to a computer that it doesn't know about unless you're running Config Manager R2 and enable its unknown computer support. In that case, it would then respond back to unknown computers that way. So recognize the difference uh, between that as well and know that all systems doesn't also include all unknown computers. So you may actually need to have two separate task sequence advertisements one that targets all systems, one that targets all unknown computers. You can also run into issues if you've never distributed the boot images out to your uh, Pixie service points because, well, then it can't possibly boot you into Pixie because there are no images available. Uh, so it's another case where you might want to run the PowerShell script as it would take care of pushing those out as well. So even if you get all this stuff right and you fixed up all of these issues, you may still see a case where it doesn't seem to be working the way you would expect it to. Well, Config Manager caches the last answer that it gave to the client. So if you had a client that was booted up and sent a request and got back an abort pixie, and then you realize that, oh, I'm missing an advertisement, 
I create the advertisement on the server and then try to pixie boot the client again, it's still not going to work. By default, Config Manager caches that response for an hour and will always give the same response for an hour unless you restart the WDS server service or do something else on the server side to cause it to forget that cache. Fortunately, there's a KB article, uh, actually a change in, I think, SP2, that enables you to shorten that time so you can change it from, say, 60 minutes down to maybe five minutes so that the next time you try it, it, it gets the current answer based on what it finds in the database at that point. So you definitely need to distribute both of the boot images out to your uh, Pixie service point. Even if you're deploying an x86 OS, you need to push out x86 and x64 boot images because it needs files from both of them. You can check the SMS Pixie log and the WDS server log to see the requests coming in, to see the database lookups that are being performed, and then see the response that's sent back. So if you look through the log files, you'll see references to lookup device and get boot action. Those are really the key ones in those cases that tell you first what device is it trying to find based on its MAC address and its uh, uh, UUID, and then how many advertisements did it find, are there boot images available for those, and then it sends the request back. You can change the cache expire time. It's described in KB2019640. If you haven't noticed recently, we've moved to seven-digit uh, KB numbers. It's bad enough to remember six-digit ones, but seven just gets worse. You need to understand the difference between the various Pixie error codes. There's a good document on the HP website that actually lists all of them and explains the subtle differences between, say, a Pixie E53 error and a Pixie E51 error. So when you start troubleshooting this, you'll want to understand the differences between those. And then the support team that actually answers the phones when you call into Microsoft support has posted a variety of uh, information around this on the SMS and MOM blog, so you can read through those as well. So troubleshooting this can be fairly involved. You need to go through and really understand the whole flow, and I would strongly suggest reading through their blog for that. So how are we doing on time? We are pretty much out of time. So it's a good thing because I think this is the last slide. So if you are still stuck, if you run into errors that you can't solve, definitely give Microsoft support a call. Have all the logs ready because they're going to ask for them anyway because that's the way they're going to help you troubleshoot. BDD.log, SMSTS.log, setupact.log. If you don't have those key set of logs, yeah, you, you can guarantee that they'll tell you, well, email us the logs and call us back when you have. So make sure that they're ready so you don't need to go through another cycle like that. There are some forums on TechNet, so you can go to the social.technet.microsoft.com and access the Config Manager OSD forum and also the MDT forum. And then there's also a, an MDT OSD mailing list hosted by myitforum.com. Uh, we actively participate on that one as well, so uh, check that one out too. If you really want to, if you're really stuck and you just want a quick answer, send me the logs, email them to me, zip them up, send them my way. I'll, I tend to look through about four or five sets of these a day. Like I looked through three of them just before this session. So you can send them my way, I'll look through them and hopefully be able to tell you that, oh, here's your problem. After you've done this a few thousand times, you look at it and say, yeah, this isn't too bad. I can figure these out pretty quickly. But the first few times you go through them, it's just massive amounts of information that you need to try to uh, figure out what it's really telling you. So that is it. Uh, hopefully that wasn't too much of death by PowerPoint, but with an hour session, really it's tough to get through that amount of troubleshooting information. Hopefully that was valuable. If not, or if you have any other questions, just uh, drop me an email or try to find me yet today. So thanks, and if you... If you want to learn more about the underlying wake tools, definitely check out Rhonda's session next.